Um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to begin with the first keynote. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Hoskins. Mike's uh, the CTO and uh, GM of Big Data at Pervasive Software. Uh, and uh, Pervasive's innovations, uh, he evangelizes and, uh, and leads uh, Pervasive's innovations in big data challenges, including cloud-based and on-premises data management and integration. And uh, Mike has a very distinguished background, including uh, AITP Austin Chapters 2007 Information Technology of the Year Award and uh, also for uh, um, doing a lot of work with uh, highly paralyzed multi-core stuff. And I'm going to introduce yeah, that's Mike. that's kind of long. I don't go. No, <laughs> but uh, so his talk, The Waking Giant, Coming Era of Enterprise Ready Pass, and take it away, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Mike Hoskins. I'm the CTO of Pervasive Software. I'm a little extra wired today. I had a very adventurous uh, travel uh, scheduled to get here last night. The fl flew through Houston, a lot of weather delays, circled around a couple hours, finally got off for New York three hours late, figured I'd get into the hotel here one, two o'clock in the morning, it'd be okay. Flying over Louisiana, hit some nasty turbulence, and then it went crazy. I've, I've been flying for 50 years, 150,000 uh, miles a year, and this was the worst turbulence I had ever experienced. There were people bouncing off the ceilings, literally broken bones. We had to emergency land in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. So I got to hang out in Lake Charles for five hours last night uh, while they were checking out the airplane and checking out the, the crew and the passengers. And I think mostly everybody's okay, but it was a, it was a big adventure. I heard some new phrases uh, coined there. Somebody said it was like uh, iPad Frisbee because uh, you're kind of weightless for a moment in these really nasty uh, uh, <laughs> sort of moments in turbulence. So the, the, the sudden up and everything's going up and then the sudden down is really terrible. But everybody keeps going up. So stuff out of my shirt pocket just went up. Out of the back pocket seats went up. Uh, iPhones flying, iPads flying. People landed on each other. It, it, was, uh, it was an interesting night. So it motivated me for, uh, for a little extravagance in the presentation. So that, that takes me to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, Chris asked me to uh, uh, look a little bit further ahead, maybe provoke a few thoughts here. So I agree with what the panelists said about the importance of PASS, I, I think it is really important. I think it's going to be the dominant tier in what you might call the cloud stack going forward. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's more revolutionary or potentially more game changing uh, than we realize. So it's not just a question of taking what we've been doing for the last 30 years and migrating it to the cloud, though I think some people think it is. I, I think it might be a new way to think about uh, applications and application development for the next 30 years. I, I think we are in one of those a very interesting shifts right now that are highly disruptive, where it isn't so much carrying the, the past forward incrementally. So let's see what, uh, what you guys think. Uh, welcome to take uh, input at the end, and I'll be wandering around uh, uh, during the day as well. So quick on Pervasive Software, my company. We're headquartered in Austin, about 250 people. Uh, been doing this for over 25 years, about 50 million a year in sales. We're a public company. Got two main businesses, data management, 25-year-old business and a data integration business. They're about half each of our 50 million. So we've been doing data, data, data infrastructure. About four or five years ago, we decided to innovate heavily in cloud and big data. Uh, we spent 25% of our R&D on, uh, on uh, excuse me, of our revenue pie on R&D, which is way in excess of what's typical in the software industry, especially for a mature software company. So, so even though we are you know, a fairly mature company, we're doing some deep innovation in cloud and big data, and I want to share uh, some of that thinking with you today. Uh, I'm going to go through a history of the cloud stack. This is one I invented, so uh, take it or leave it, but we're going to go through that a little bit to set the stage for PaaS. Uh, what's Enterprise PaaS going to look like? This is where it gets a little controversial. Again, I'm not just looking backwards. I'm trying to look uh, forward at, uh, at, at the radical changes that might be coming. Uh, what's it going to mean to app developers? I, I think that's the, the nub, exactly what they said earlier. I think it hugely empowers a new generation of applications that are fundamentally and violently different than applications we've had in the past. And finally, what does it mean to us? What, what's, uh, how's it going to change our lives uh, in the coming years? So let's dive in. Uh, arbitrary, as I said, I'm going to start the history of the cloud stack in 1998 uh, with uh, a company called Salesforce.com, who for most of us, I think, defined a lot of what we think of as SaaS, at least, a software as a service. Uh, I've got little chiclets up here representing the cloud stack. Uh, what was interesting about this was though they offered their CRM service in the cloud, we know them pretty well. We wrote the world's first connector to Salesforce.com back in 2001, got hundreds and hundreds of uh, partner customers with, 
uh, Salesforce uh, on the data integration side. What's interesting about this was that it was a monolith. Th this was long before they could adopt uh, other people's software. They wrote it all from scratch. In some ways, I mean, look how old it is. That's already 14 years old. Th this is not necessarily the cutting edge of what application development is on the cloud today. Uh, they had to invent their own infrastructure as a service. They had to invent their own platform as a service. They didn't call it that. And of course, software as a service. And we consumed it as software as a service, but in fact, that entire inherent, nascent cloud stack was there. They just had to build it brick by brick themselves. You go forward uh, quite a ways before you had, I think, the next most significant change. Uh, and that is a, a development where a new player emerged, and that's an independent infrastructure as a service vendor. Uh, this is hugely important. Uh, I, I'm in the Hadoop space quite a bit. I'll ask a question. How many of you in the room have heard of Hadoop? That's good. How many of you have some kind of active, experimental, tire-kicking, skunkworks project in Hadoop? So that's less. Maybe now we're down to 20%. How many of you have something in production in Hadoop? That's Pretty good number, that's four, five, six, good. I wanna to talk to you guys, just kidding. Uh, the, the, uh, so I, I, I was at a panel the other day and somebody said uh, there, are, there, there have been a million Hadoop clusters stood up on Amazon Web Services. And I, I was flabbergasted by that number, I said it's not possible, so I challenged the analyst who said it and she sent me the quote and was one of those AWS directors, I think, I don't know if you know how secretive AWS is about how many developers and all this stuff is, I, I think they have a giant lead in there and they're probably trying to preserve some of the secrecy around that lead. But yeah, there was a direct quote from an AWS uh, director who said they have had, uh, I'm not sure they're all in production, you stand things up in AWS just because you can and then you never use them again. Still, a million Hadoop clusters is amazing. My point is, this is a rampant runaway success. And so they really opened my eyes at least as to what's possible as the cloud stack stratifies a little bit and, and, and becomes uh, closer to what we recognize today. Next big change for me, and this is arbitrary, like I said, what was important to me, is SaaS at the top. I'm sneaking mobile in here today. I didn't hear anything about mobile uh, this morning. I think that's, that's something that's important. Uh, and then we had the emergence of sort of infrastructure and pass together, still as a mini monolith, uh, and the, uh, the key vendors in that space, there's a bunch of them, but Azure to me is kind of the poster child of somebody who said, I'll do the whole infrastructure, and I won't do like Amazon, I just won't leave you with naked, you know, coarse-grained AWS services. I'll offer you the whole uh, platform as a service, friendlier to developers, on top of my infrastructure service, and then you can build that incredible generation of SaaS uh, on top of that. So that is now moving closer to where we are today, and finally that brings us uh, to where we are today, I think, and this again is an arbitrary date, but this is a a division now that uh, speaks to me uh, effectively of, of where we are today. I think of the cloud stack as a tripartite stack. Uh, clearly, there's the application layer at the top. Uh, clearly, there's the infrastructure at the bottom. We have some giants in that space. And I think we're starting to see a platform as a service emerge there. And I don't mean the fact that Azure lets you get past services. I mean sort of independent uh, free agents in the past space running on arbitrary cloud infrastructure ab below them and servicing arbitrary app developers above them, like what the gentleman said a little bit earlier on the panel. So I think that's kind of where we, uh, where we are today. Um, and I've, I've just got one more in here, which is uh, uh, our IPaaS. IPaaS stands for Integration Platform as a Service. The reason I kind of see the world like this is because we've seen the world like this for three years, and when I started our cloud initiative, uh, we built out something called the Pervasive Data Cloud. The Pervasive Data Cloud is a elastic cloud of data services that lives on top of Amazon's elastic cloud of compute services and infrastructure services and offers up what we do, uh, things like data integration, data quality, data management type services. And I'm gonna show a quick diagram of that because at least you can see what a living, breathing, independent, autonomous pass layer. How independent and autonomous am I? I'm pretty wedded to AWS. So I'm kind of happy they linked up with Eucalyptus. Maybe there'll be some private cloud that runs Eucalyptus and I can use the same uh, API. Maybe Rackspace is gonna you know, eventually do an AWS clone API. I don't know. I don't know whether I'm gonna have to support multiple infrastructure layers below me or whether everybody's gonna run and adopt the AWS uh, API like the SQL of infrastructure as a service. I don't know that, uh, but that's what we've adopted so far. So at the very low level, I have infrastructure services that live heavily on top of AWS. Uh, on top of that, I've got uh, my core services. These are the higher order services, uh, things like data quality, data matching, data profiling, data integration services. Somebody referred to it earlier. Uh, this is 
a layer of services that are above the infrastructure but below the application. Uh, so we do something we call embedded integration where other app developers could quickly find an elastic integration plumbing and run on top of that as a service, unbeknownst to them what exists below me in the cloud stack. And then finally on top of that are the, the actual RESTful and other services that we provide uh, out to app developers so that they can get the services that we happen to select. And so in the past universe, we're not a monolithic serving all kind of pass. We're not pretending to be you know, .NET on Azure. We're, we're just saying this is our little piece of the kingdom. The pass world might be infinitely larger than us, but it will consist of players like us who are delivering some level of elastic, discoverable, contracted, data-intensive services, I think, that live above infrastructure and below uh, the app layer. So that's an arbitrary view of where we are today. This is a sample of a, of a pass that exists and is out there today for people to, to run. So where does it go in the future? That's kind of a look back. Uh, maybe it helps you guys. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you agree. Maybe you don't. I'd love feedback later. Uh, where does it go from here? And I think I, I disagree a little bit with uh, some of the things I heard uh, so far this morning and some of the things I, I hear out in the market. Uh, the diagram here doesn't show it. I'm going to explain it in the next slides. But I think infrastructure as a service stays. I think it grows. It encroaches. Already three years later, there are services that we have built into our past that are now available in AWS. And I wish we could exploit the AWS services instead of having written them ourselves. In fact, this is the eternal battle for all app developers. No matter where you are in the stack, the bottom of the stack gets commoditized and eats you up. And you have to run up the stack as fast as you can. So I think infrastructure as a service is hugely important. I think PaaS is the area where the most change and development and innovation and important uh, aspects of IT are, are going to emerge. I think application development, and notice I've changed the title now, application development is going to be still the most important part of the stack, but I think it's going to get thinner. I think functionality is very easy to see emerging into the PaaS layer. In fact, I've done little layers in that PaaS chiclet uh, to show you that PaaS itself, I think, becomes a hierarchy of different grain services with fairly fat pass platforms like us, like our pervasive data cloud at the bottom on those bars, getting up to finer and finer grained pass services that are easier perhaps for the app layer to consume. And again, I say app layer. I, I heard people this morning talk about the, the pass world as if it's going to support cloud-based SaaS application development. You know, I'm not sure that's true. I'm sure that pass is going to be there, and I'm sure that pass is going to be essentially maybe the essence of cloud computing. But what if the apps are all mobile? What if they all run on smartphones? What if they all run on iPads and tablets and, and, and are not browser-based ever again? You know, that's, that's something to think about. So what's, uh, let's drill into that pass middle part of that uh, uh, chiclet. So I've put enterprise pass up here. Uh, partly because it's the name of the conference. That's always good. Uh, but partly because uh, I think it can be enterprise pass, what I'm going to talk about, but it isn't your father's enterprise. It's going to be a different view of how we might do uh, application development, and I think it's going to heavily inform the pass layer below it. So I don't think it's traditional middleware. It's not, it's not the, in fact, even the word stack, I think, is wrong. I'm not sure pass is going to be a stack. It has been. All of us have been in IT a long time. We consume stacks. Some of us are at the back end server side. We build stacks. We write middleware. We consume middleware. We are largely occupied in building fairly heavy, monolithic, traditional application stacks. And is that really, given the cloud and given what pass promises, what's going to happen over the next 30 years? So I'm not so sure. I don't think we're going to just port our middleware there, although people are doing that. Uh, I don't think we're going to port our traditional client-server architectures, though people are doing that. And I don't think it's just you know, a cloud-based application like Lamp. I don't think it is. I think it is non-stack. I think pass means, eventually, a world that is nothing but services that have their defined contracts, uh, their defined metadata, they're defined and well-respected and well-defended APIs that exist somewhere in the universe. I don't know what stack it runs on. The hypervisor question was interesting earlier, because you're right. We don't want to get into those wars. In fact, if you even have that in your conversation, is that how apps are going to be developed? Does anybody care? Should anybody care who's at the application development tier? As long as what's below them is a defined 
and defended and well-documented service that has a contract and obeys its contract, who cares? Now, it might be coarse-grained, it might be fine-grained, it might be you know, a fairly heavy service, it might be a family, an aggregated natural family of adjacent services, but I'm not sure that it's going to be a stack. I'm not sure that you're going to go to a vendor to get it. So I don't think it's our traditional view of software at all. I think it's just elastic services. So what else does it mean to us then? This one's really important. I think it's a mixed vendor environment. Uh, where did we go if we're application developers? We adopted the green stack from Microsoft or the red stack from Oracle, or maybe we got really brave and we used a little bit of both. You know, but we were still beholden to monolithic stack producers. That's how we consume things. They were the guardians. They were the conduit. That's how we got middleware. That's how we got uh, the infrastructure stack that we might think of as platform as a service. Is that going to be true in the future? I don't think it's going to be any more true in the future than we get our news from the New York Times. I, I, I think the days when there was a huge production of things we were interested in that went to a skinny, pipelined, pinhole conduit that owned access so that it could dribble it out to us in some kind of vendor powerful way. I think that model has been blown up by the internet. It's been blown up in data. It's been blown up in publishing. It's blown up multiple. Why shouldn't it blow up software? Could it blow up software? Are we going to go to a stack vendor in order to get the services that we would describe as platform as a service? I'm not sure that's true. I think we're going to move away from monolithic vendor stacks uh, to best of breed services. I think you see that in uh, a lot of mobile app development. And again, I go back to mobile. Where, where is the center of gravity in app development these days? Is it really SaaS? Is it really cloud-based applications? You know, and are, are the mobile guys, do the mobile guys download the Oracle developer toolkit so that they can build their, you know, their mobile apps? Are they ever going to? No. You know, so, so the things are changing out there right under our feet. So I think we, we, we're less beholden to the dominant vendor model of, I produce the stack, you stand in line and consume it as a customer of me, to a best of breed. Uh, I think there are diminishing barriers to entry, which means we should enjoy a cornucopia of platform level services, and therefore a cornucopia of applications, whether they're SaaS type cloud applications or whether they're mobile applications on top of that. And I think the power pendulum therefore has swung already away from the traditional software industry who own the IP assets. The power pendulum has swung over to the app developer who now owns the customer, which is always the single most important relationship to own. Uh, the consumerization of mobile and app development, I think, is a fantastic thing. It has raised the bar significantly on, on what software should look like, how friendly it should be, how easy it should be, how agile it should be. Uh, in the same, I mean, was SaaS a way station? I mean, I, I applauded the early SaaS vendors because they literally raised the bar over traditional enterprise class software in terms of ease of use and ease of adoption. And that was a fantastic thing. But is, is that the end or is that a middle station? When, when truly paradigmatic change happens, like the internet, it takes decades sometimes for new ecosystems to emerge for how we do things. And, and the first 10 or 15 years are always spent dragging the old models forward and incrementally massaging them and beating them into shape so that they still work. But is that really the way to fully exploit these kinds of important changes? I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's worth, uh, worth thinking about. So we saw that it's probably not going to be traditional large uh, stacks. It's probably not going to come from uh, traditional large vendors. Where is it going to come from? I think it's going to come from a, I called it a service store, an app store, a community store. Uh, I, th I think the monolithic power breaks down. If, if I go to something like, uh, like iTunes or the app store, any community store, do I, do I go first to the, to the Microsoft sub store and look for just the Microsoft? No, I don't. I search for functionality out of the vast ocean of 500,000 services or apps that are available. That model wasn't available to us before without the internet. Now that it is available to the internet, it is literally exploding and destroying traditional models in all sorts of businesses. Might it do that in services, in software as a service, in software services, in platform as a service? I think it has a great chance to. Apogee is a company I know. They're a, 
They're nothing but a catalog of APIs, of web services. They wrote a great blog a couple of months ago about how that's really platform as a service. Platform as a service isn't you know, some, some hard, you know, hewn wood out of the forest where you whacked and whacked and whacked on it for 20 years. It's simply me. I'm just a catalog. I've cataloged every single service that's available on the internet, and maybe I, I have thumbs up and thumbs down, and maybe people who consume them vote on how good or bad they are, and maybe there's a description on it, maybe there's a rising star and falling star, and, and I could, if I'm an app developer, I could find my services that I need in the vast ocean of elastic services by consulting an aggregator or a catalog service more than a traditional monolithic branded vendor. Is that where the power is going to go? Is it going to go to these Ebays and Amazon? Is Amazon eventually going to be platform as a service? Not because they grew AWS, but because they became the home for everybody who might want to monetize their great idea uh, as a service for app developers to consume. Uh, naturally, community uh, plays an important role there. And, and I think there's some self-organizing principles uh, here at play also as service Numbers mount as the population gets large. I think natural adjacencies and natural aggregations occur in the cataloging of these services. So, yeah, I might argue that pass in the future is not a, you know, a room where 22 people think really hard about, you know, what's pass, and they go, this is it, and they work for two years and they ship it. In fact, is it even a meaningful statement to say you ship it? You know, maybe it's an evolved reality of millions of developers working autonomously on some common cloud fabrics and backbones, and that emerges in a self-organized way as PaaS, uh, rather than the traditional model we've grown used to. Uh, I think there are then hierarchies of granularity in these services, uh, if this vision of PaaS might come true. And so those, again, those, those lines in there from rich and complex families of services to simple standalone services, I think if my Story is right, those thick lines at the bottom is where we are right now. There are vendors in the room delivering pass. I've got a pass, an integration platform as a service. That is a fairly thick, heavy service. To even learn how to use that and consume it takes real work. Uh, but it has real functionality in there. So I think there's a trade-off between work and richness and functionality. But eventually I'm hoping that on top of my thicker, heavier pass, people write much thinner sub-services or aggregations of services or mixes of services that mix mine and somebody else and do a composition of a higher order service that's maybe simpler to consume that speaks more effectively to the app developer. And so I think pass evolves in that kind of pyramid, uh, not by quantity, that's a pyramid of functionality where much simpler services prevail. Uh, I think single function prospers in a way that it couldn't in the past, I think specialization prospers. You could not do single function and specialization without the ecosystems of things like like pass stores or app stores. I mean, you can be three guys in China with an idea, and, and, and six weeks later, you've got an app that could be a top-selling app. There's no front office. You don't have to do the accounting. You don't have to do the billing. You don't have to do the marketing. You don't have to do anything. You just, you just in a much different way than in the past, think about an app, invent it, uh, and get it to market. And that, to, to, to be a full reality, I think depends on a really, really robust, rich middle layer of elastic services that are, that are thick and thin that that app community can use. And finally, I heard this mentioned earlier and I, I couldn't agree more, I think uh, pass, I think all of our, what, what we call traditional IT is going to become much more data centric as opposed to software centric. I, I think we had a 30 year run uh, from 1955 to 85 where software didn't exist, it was all about hardware. We had a, a 30 year run from, from 85 to whenever that is where software was everything. And I think we're entering an age where, where data becomes everything. Uh, it always was. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on my fifth CRM system in the last 10 years. I can go into that CRM system. I can find a customer that existed 10 years ago, still in there. The data is immortal. The data is all that matters. The software is an ephemeral skin that I can shed tomorrow and bring another skin so that I can access my data. And I think this is going to happen. And I, I, think, I think the thinning of software is an absolute trend that you're going to see. And so if I'm right that platform as a service means that, that people are, are laboring to build this copious layer of thick and middle and thin services uh, so that app developers can, can consume them quickly, then I think they're going to become increasingly data centric. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, so I'm a big fan of RESTful interactions. If the world is data centric, then it's, it, it consists of zillions and zillions of nouns and just a couple of verbs. You know, the gets, the puts, the updates, that's it, and everything else is data. And maybe software thins out wildly 
from what we think of as software today. And I think these kinds of paradigm shifts help because we have to rewrite things in many ways. That doesn't mean we have to drag our old stuff forward and incrementally rewrite it. We start fresh with new concepts. And one of those new concepts is we write services much more quickly. They're much thinner. Uh, and they expose uh, data much more uh, regularly and availably to the app developer, to the customer. And then lastly, that means the rise of analytic apps in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, when is the next SAP going to be written? Will it ever be written? Will SAP just become a service? Will SAP become one of these low, low-level platform-as-a-service infrastructure kind of plays and people will build other services on top of them? I think there's a chance that that might be true. Uh, might be true of any enterprise app. Uh, and so what do you do? What do you do with this raw data that lives in all these traditional legacy systems? Well, you begin to redivide it and recombine it in all sorts of interesting analytic ways. And I think the core transactional processing uh, has been solved. I think it's going to continue to be solved, as I'll talk about later, maybe in radically new ways. But a lot of the innovation, a lot of the new services, and a lot of the new apps will be, uh, the services will be very data-oriented, and the apps on top of them will be very analytic oriented, just taking a little piece of data and helping you know where, where to turn and what's next and who's there. And I, so I'm obviously using a very wide-ranging definition of analytic app. But I think a lot of apps, if you look at what's popular in the, in the mobile community, uh, you'll see a lot of what you might call analytic apps emerging as very powerful and very popular. So those are my five sort of glimpses into the future of, of a different view of what enterprise uh, pass might be, one that's a little bit radically different than the trajectory you might think we're on uh, where we stand today. So what does it mean to app developers? I think it's highly disruptive to the traditional sort of monolithic app stack development. I think everything is about lightweight, fast, and agile. You know, as, as Darwin said, it's not the strong, it's not the, the smart that win, it's the adaptable that win. And so speed is everything, agility is everything, and I, I think the internet has accelerated that trend, and I think app developers are going to win who, who are friends of that trend. Uh, I think the front end of the stack, the user experience backs the Trump, uh, trumps the back end of the stack. Uh, as I said before, who cares uh, what's behind the service as long as it's up 24 by 7 and obeys its contract. Uh, and I think SaaS and mobile continue to dominate. And like I said before, I, you know, the latest news around Facebook over the last couple of weeks is uh, you know, it's, it's, it's largely a web-based phenomenon you know, when the world has gone to application. And it's not just mobile, even the iPad is a, is a heavy app friendly, you know, the revenge of, of, of uh, Jobs over Gates, I mean, he, he wins the heavy sort of fat client wars now where we're developing for uh, Linux <laughs> running on an iOS or Linux running on an iPad. Uh, so I think those, those will be, it's the front end, it's the SaaS app, it's the mobile app uh, that dominates. That's uh, going to be very different than how we traditionally develop uh, applications. Um, I think we will as I write here, apps are less written and more assembled. Uh, many people will groan when they see this word. This has been a, a famous pipe dream in software for a long time that we'll, we'll just compose our applications instead of writing them. And of course, that hasn't been true. But, but must we fail forever? Is there an opportunity, maybe with the internet, maybe with the arrival of, of cloud-based stacks and, and a wide variety of, of services, elastic services in the past? Maybe it is. That second bullet is really important. Finding functionality becomes less expensive than writing it from scratch. It's hard to find functionality today. If you're an IT developer, you barely get across you know, the cube. When we had a, a development uh, VP in our company once, and he told a story he used to work for BMC. He walked in, and somebody had to write an XSLT processor or something. So he sat and he said, yeah, we're going to write it. He thought, you know, we should look around the company. Maybe somebody already wrote uh, one of these XML. Actually, it was an XML parser. And he looked around, and they had written 34 XML parsers. And he was about to write the 35th. And so, so developers are in a, in a very stovepipe kind of world traditionally. The internet changes that. It becomes cheaper and easier to discover things because you can discover, think back to my point about catalogs and the eBay of platform services. And if you can quickly discover services and quickly bolt them on, maybe we can enter that golden age of applications being assembled more and written less. And I've talked about how the data-centric side is important. And finally, I think we get all together new delivery models uh, for software. 
the application level software. Subscriptions are right now moving from time-based to database, data metering, we call that uh, at Pervasive. I'm a, a big believer in that as the final end game for how we, it's, it's about the data. <laughs> All you care about is your data and how you access it and how often you access it and with what latency you can access that data. And so that's kind of a metering problem, a little bit more complicated than water metering, but the same kind of problem. Um, it's all about experimentation and adoption now, so speed and agility is everything. And the consumption model changes. How will a new generation of HR apps be built? You know, we don't, we don't build PeopleSoft anymore. Now we build Taleos and success factors, but is that the way it's gonna be in 10 years? Are they gonna be mobile? Are they gonna be monolithic if they're mobile? Maybe an HR app is, is six mobile apps. Maybe it's 22 mobile apps and you pick three of them. And so this, you know, maybe you enter your, your HR app from your Facebook account or your LinkedIn account, or maybe your company does. You know, maybe the, the notion of a, of a monolith app even isn't true. And there are frameworks that you live inside, like, for, like Facebook, and apps are just services exposed with many applet type functionalities at the user interface level. So I'll finally wrap with uh, some summary thoughts here uh, about the long-term impact of this uh, idea of PaaS. So I, I think it's, it's in the early, early, early days. We don't know. I like the comments earlier about look three, five years out, look five, ten years out. This could be you know, the, a, a very big change uh, in software. Uh, the fact that PaaS has arrived late to the cloud stack evolution I think is a positive thing. Uh, I think new consumers of it are going to drag it in radically new directions. Uh, I think uh, infrastructure and pass are gonna blur. I mean, if Amazon does database services and then they have six databases and then they do database transaction services and then they do backup services, at what point does infrastructure as a service bleed into platform as a service? I think it will. Uh, and so it's kind of a continuum, you could argue, all the way from the bottom to that last service that is non-user centric that an app developer can consume. As I said, the power pendulum continues to swing. Uh, SaaS and mobile I've talked about, um, and the, the end of enterprise apps is a funny thing to say in the middle of an enterprise uh, pass conference, but I think it could be true. I think the pass could be the, the enterprise functionality that we think of. Pass could get massively developed, massively rich as a layer of granular services between the low level infrastructure and the app. And the app layer is still important, but it gets much thinner because more work is done at the pass layer which means apps are small components uh, that live inside other applications, as I said before, like, like LinkedIn and Facebook. I mean, what is an HR app? D does a company need to bring a bunch of data and software and stick it you know, anywhere, even in their cloud, so they can work on your data? Maybe you own your data. Maybe you own yourself, and like you own your spleen, you own your data about yourself. And maybe it lives in Facebook or LinkedIn, and maybe your HR application is nothing but access secure through a contract to a service, a past service, that is the owner and custodian and guardian of that data object. Maybe that's what application development looks like. So, radical thoughts there on, uh, on how important I think PASS is and how it could take a hop to the right uh, and, and change the way we see uh, the layers of the stack, especially application development above it. Uh, so that's it, I think, for me. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be wandering around, so if anybody's got any questions, uh, Feel free to grab me and I'd love to have a chat. Thank you very much.